my love for you people and for the love of teaching forestry akarsh is your reporting for today indian forest communities are is in charge working under the regime going to become a deputy range forest officer coming to the first question define wood explain the microscopic or anatomical features which aid in identification of timber species in detail so wood is the hard fibrous lignified substance under the bark of trees wood is composed of carbohydrates cellulose and lignin which are isomeric with the starch and the anatomical structure of wood you know it consists of pith heartwood sapwood annual rings bark grain and texture bezel or pores tyloses fibers tracheids pith flex rays ripple marks intercellular canals so we'll go through each one of them the first one pith it is a small mass of tissues in the center of the tree stem this is varied in size and shape which imparts the mechanical strength to the wood second one heartwood heartwood lies outside the pith composed of dead cells this gives dark color and rigidity to wood besides improving quality and durability third one sapwood sapwood lies over the heartwood this is lighter in color and composed of living cells the sapwood stores food and conducts cell sap it is less durable than heartwood coming to the fourth one annual rings outside the sapwood cambium layer forms a ring of cells all around the cells formed during the spring season differs with the cells formed during the summer as this seasons comes twice a year wood form two kinds of cell alternatively this gives a ring like structure which is referred as annual rings fifth one bark this overlies the cambium layer composed of dead as well as living cells the bark varies in thickness color and appearance in different species as you can see this diagram you know it consists of the first layer is bark second is bast third one is cambium and the fourth one sapwood and again hardwood pith or medulla annual rings medullary rays coming to the sixth one grain and texture grain is the arrangement of cells or wood elements relative to the main axis of the tree it is classified as straight spiral and interlocked it adds beauty to the timber texture refers to the relative smoothness or coarseness of wood surface coming to the seventh one vessel or pores vessel or pores are rather short cells with a wide openings these appear like tube like rays running longitudinally through the wood when seen on a longitudinal section when cut across they appear on the end surface of wood as a small circular or somewhat oval openings or holes and therefore they are called as pores the woods of a broad leaved species is described as a porous whereas woods of conifers are referred as a non porous as it does not contain vessels based on the arrangement of pores which can be divided into rings porous woods and diffused porous woods coming to the eighth one tyloses tyloses are the outgrowth in the pores this sometimes occludes the pores entirely it makes the timber more durable as they impede air and moisture movements thereby protecting it against the fungal attack but it creates difficulty in impregnation of preservatives while preservation coming to the eighth one fibers these are the narrow elongated cells with the tapering ends the main function of the fibers is to give mechanical support to the wood coming to the ninth one tracheids tracheids are the hollow needle shaped longitudinal elements it is characterized by the presence of large border pits on their walls in coniferous woods this conduct sap 
and gives rigidity to wood. Coming to the tenth one, pith flex. In certain timbers, soft tissues occur in irregular patches with no relation to the general arrangement of parenchyma. These abnormal patches of parenchyma are formed as a result of injury to the cambium and are called as pith flex. Coming to the eleventh one, rays. Rays are group of horizontally oriented parenchyma cells which run in a radial direction from pith to periphery. These are called as primary rays if they extend from pith Secondary rays are arising at some distance from the pith in between the primary rays. Coming to the twelfth one, ripple marks. Some woods show a series of fine equidistant wavy lines at right angles to the grain. As it looks ripple marking on sand, it is called as ripple marks. Coming to the thirteenth one, intercellular canals. Intercellular canals are long tubular cavities found in wood. These serve as a repositories of waste product of metabolic activity such as resin and gum. Therefore, these are called as resin canals or gum ducts. This completes the first question. Coming to the second question, describe various physiological mechanisms underlying drought resistance, drought tolerance and drought avoidance in forest species. See plants in different regions have different physiological as well as morphological adaptations. These adaptations are essential for the survival of these plants under particular conditions. The different adaptation mechanism under different environment is explained in detail. The first one, adaptation for drought conditions. It includes two different types of mechanism. One is a mechanism to conserve water. Another one is mechanism to improve water uptake. See, mechanism to conserve water includes six steps. That is, the first one, stomatal mechanism. Second one, increased photosynthetic efficiency. Third one, lipid deposition. Fourth one, reduction in leaf area. Fifth one, leaf surface have thick cuticle waxy surface. Sixth one, water storage in plants. And, and the mechanism to improve water uptake, it includes, you know, osmotic adjustment, cell membrane stability, plant growth regulators, role of abscisic acid, root shoot ratio. Let's go through each one of them. The first one, the facts that come under the mechanisms to conserve the water. First one, stomatal mechanism. Drought resistant plants open the stomata mostly during the night conditions in order to reduce the evaporative water losses. Second one, increased photosynthetic efficiency. Stomatal resistant plants have higher photosynthetic efficiency. Because of this, stomata are opened for short duration only, which reduces the transpiration losses. Third one, lipid deposition. Fourth one, reduction in leaf area. Fifth one, leaf surface have a thick cuticle waxy surface. Sixth one, water storage in plants. Moving on to the mechanism to improve water uptake. See, these plants have an efficient root system, both deep as well as fibrous root system. Under this, we are going to discuss about the osmotic adjustment. See, the roles of osmotic adjustments are Osmotic adjustment helps to maintain the cell water balance with the active accumulation of solutes in the cytoplasm, thereby minimizing the harmful effects of drought. While high turgor maintenance increases the photosynthetic rate and growth. Coming to the second one, cell membrane stability. Generally, it is known that cell membranes are the first target of many abiotic stresses. Therefore, the main component for drought tolerance in plant is to preserve integrity and stability of cell membrane. Also, membrane stability of the leaf segment is an essential trait to examine the germplasm for drought tolerance. On the other side, cell membrane stability depleted quickly when exposed to drought with heat stress at once. Third one, plant growth regulators. Phytohormones play vital roles in drought tolerance of plants and have influence on physiological process in plant. 
Under drought stress, the production of endogenous auxins is reduced. However, abscisic acid and ethylene produce increases usually. Auxins breaking root apical dominance and stimulate to produce new root to improve the imperative role of prolific root system in drought tolerance. Coming to the fourth one, role of abscisic acid. Abscisic acid is a natural growth inhibitor and is produced under abiotic stress conditions including drought. All higher plants respond to drought under various stresses by producing and accumulating abscisic acid. Under drought conditions, synthesis of abscisic acid increases to close stomatal and reduce water loss through reduced transpiration. Coming to the fifth one, root shoot ratio. In drought resistant, plant roots are higher compared to transpiring shoots so that water balance is maintained. Now talking about the drought avoidance or the mechanism to avoid the loss of water. See it includes morphological adaptations and anatomical adaptations and the third one physiological adaptations. We'll go through each one of them. The first one morphological adaptations. The first point leaf angle is more or less perpendicular to surface of earth so that the area by which light falls is reduced. Second one, surface area of the leaf should be minimum. Third one, root system is deep and extensive. Coming to the second one, anatomical adaptation. It includes six points. The first one, reduction in resistance to water flow. Second one, osmotic adjustments. Third one, stomata presence at deep and mostly at the bottom of the leaf surface. Fourth one, palisade parenchyma is higher and spongy parenchyma is fever. Fifth one, cortex and hypodermis is several layered. Sixth one, inner layer has a mucilage storage. Coming to the third one, that is physiological adaptations. Here it includes only two points. The first one, proline accumulation is higher, which resists water loss from plant. Second one, increased photosynthetic efficiency of plants. So this completes the second question. Coming to the third question. What is controlled grazing? Describe how it helps in the better management of forest pasture land. Controlled grazing includes any system in which the producer controls the grazing pattern of the cattle. It is known by many names such as rotational grazing, intensive grazing and strip grazing. The objectives of controlled grazing are to increase efficiency, to lower costs, Third one, to gain more profit from existing resources and ecologically maintain those resources have led many progressive ranchers to controlled grazing. See, controlled grazing is the management of forage with grazing. It limits access to grazing by subdividing pastures with a permanent and temporary fences. When compared to controlled grazing practices, traditional grazing methods prove inefficient in terms of energy production and operation. Second one, controlled grazing results in increased amounts of forage harvested by animals, improved forage quality, extended grazing seasons, reduced fertilizer and herbicide applications, reduced labor and feed costs, fever weeds, environmentally responsible grazing areas. Third point, fencing plays a critical role in the success of controlled grazing. New fencing options and technology simplify controlled grazing more than ever and helps improve results such as a forage quality, production and environmental impact. So this completes the third question. Coming to the fourth question, what is forest valuation? Writes its objectives and briefly explain the method of forest valuation. See, forest valuation is the process of estimating the value of something. Forest valuation refers to the estimation of value of forest property. This includes both land and trees growing on it. It includes both tangible and intangible benefits derived from the forest. Both biotic and abiotic components of the forest are taken into consideration while assessing the value of forest. Purposes of forest valuation include seven steps. You know, the first one to determine the capital value of the forest or tree crops. Second one to determine the rate of forest capital information. Third one to transfer the forest land to other government or private agencies. 
fourth one to acquire a private forest land by government and give compensation for that fifth one to analyze the past and present facts of forest capital for forest valuation studies sixth one to monitor the economic returns from the investment made in the forests seventh one to predict the value of forest in future the value of land is estimated based on the use of land and output obtained per unit area in the same way the value of a forest is calculated by estimating the output or product from the forest it calculates the values of animals plants and inanimate such as minerals and other valuables in the area for example for a forest its value is the average annual income from that area the basis for valuation it includes first one cost value second one income value third one market value and in that market value we have a fossman and chapman derivation something like that we'll go through each one of them the first one cost value see it is based on the historical cost replacement cost restoration cost and present land value cost this is poor base for valuation due to the non availability of information regarding the historical costs and the increase in the forest and value second one income value income value is the estimated present net worth of all future earnings or other returns expected from a forest property it depends on the rate of interest this is also not good due to the non availability of yield tables for various species and market prices for all the products third one market value it is an excellent indicator of the value of a product or commodity parameters affecting the market value you know this considers site quality topography composition density age road accessibility water availability mode of appraisal this gives better results this is useful for acquiring private land for public use fastman obtain the soil expectation value based on the assessment of output from the forest he considers a cleared land and which is waiting to be planted from this land he assumed intermittent yield of thinning and final yield throughout the infinite series of rotation he expressed this in a mathematical equation form the principle involved here is the whole value is equal to the sum of all intermittent and final yields see chapman calculated the value of forest using simple compound interest relationship between a given sum now that is represented as v not and the amount n years after that is that can be represented as vn see vn is equal to v not of 1 plus i on the top of it n i is equal to vn divided by v not of 1 divided by n minus 1 so this is the formula that chapman calculated to you know calculate the value of forest so this completes the fourth question coming to the fifth question what are the particle boards explain the features of different types of particle boards particle board it is a board made up of the fragments of wood and other lignocellulosic materials bonded with organic binders with the help of one or more agents like heat pressure humidity catalysts etc this is made from chips flakes splinters the main types are chipboard flake board shaving board the features of the chipboard are as follows the first one chipboard is available in a number of densities like normal medium and high density normal density is fairly soft and easily worked high density is solid and hard the second point it is a moisture resistant however you should avoid allowing chipboard to get wet third point lower cost fourth point chipboards smoother surface and texture allow builders to save money on tooling fifth one chipboard is more resistant to warping and will not splinter sixth point chipboard is available with a flame retardant treatment and some common features of flake board and shave board are as follows see flake board is made up of uh, you know shavings and flakes of wood that are generated at sawmills 
Second point, to manufacture flake board, a mill will use a variety of woods because the surface appearance of its board doesn't need to provide a pleasant aesthetic. Third point, it has a basic features of particle board as follows. You know, the first one, weight and density. Second one, strength. Third one, resistance to moisture. Fourth one, resistance to warping. Fifth one, durability. Sixth one, insulation. Seventh one, fire resistance. And eighth one, eco-friendly. We'll go through each one of these common, you know, features of uh, the particle board, like flake board and shaving board. You can write down it for chipboard as well. The first one, weight and density. As it is composed of wood chips, wood shavings and sawdust, which are waste material and hence it is very less weight. Second one, strength. Particle boards have low strength as they are made from weak materials like wood chips and sawdust. They can't withstand heavy loads. Third point, resistance to moisture. Low resistance to moisture. In the presence of moisture, the boards experience swelling and development of cracks may occur. Also on exposure to moisture, particle board gets discolored. The fourth point, resistance to warping. Low resistance to warping, but coating it with prime or painting the particle board can improve its resistance. Fifth point, durability. As it has low strength, boards are less durable compared to plywood or solid wood. It can last for up to 3 to 5 years. Sixth one, insulation. It has a sound insulation properties. Thus, they are used in partition walls and ceilings of recording studios and concert, concert halls. And concert halls. Seventh one, fire resistance. The board can be made fire resistant by attaching a layer of melanine on the top surface. As they are manufactured from recycled materials and waste such as wood chips, wood shavings, sawdust, etc., Thus, it helps in environmental conservation to some extent. So, this completes the fifth question.